Welcome to You've Got This with Sarah Hamaker, a podcast to encourage and equip moms along their parenting journey. Join Sarah each week as she interviews dads and moms like you and discusses the joys, challenges, and rewards of raising kids. Hi, and welcome to this week's You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hamaker, and I'm glad you join me. Today I have with me Lynn Zachary. She's a therapist in Chicago. And Lynn and I worked a few years ago on a book about depression, um, especially as it relates to um, kids and teens. And that's going to be our topic today because the mental health of our kids is so important. And when we as parents can be a little more aware of maybe some of the signs we need to look for in our kids where they may need some extra help or um, just some ways that we can help them navigate this extremely high pressure world they live in with social media, with all the emphasis on, especially in high school, on getting into the, the right college and all this kind of stuff. Um, we really want to make sure that we're paying attention to our kids and their, um, their mental health. So, Lynn, um, now we were just talking before we started recording how we both have teenagers, <laughs> and yes. I think that's marvelous. I always say I have two teenage girls, as my listeners know, and I just love them. They're just really great. But I've noticed that they put a lot of pressure on themselves, um, in, in, especially academically. Have you found that to be true, that kids today really kind of are more aware of how they're doing in school than, than we were? Oh, yeah, I think it's a given now as opposed to am I going to try hard? It's it's just sort of you you fake it till you make it, even if you are not all that driven. You're, there's this almost judgment if you're mm. not trying. Um, when we were in high school, they, those were the cool kids. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they could get away with not trying, and now it's um, – Oh, you know, if you're not trying, it's what's wrong. You don't care what's wrong with you. Right. And I and I also think, too, it can be so easy to check your progress these days. Right. I mean, teachers are posting things online almost immediately. You know, they never had the, oh, I can't find out what I'm going to what I how I did on that test for another week. So I'm not going to worry about it because it's almost this instantaneous feedback, I think plays a part at least I see that in my own um, kids anxiety about school or just over concerned about their grades yeah there was um, there's a lot of that starting when kids are a little too young to Mm. handle that because when they're younger that need to please teachers is really strong I don't think kids have really identified um, like self-wise of what kind of student they are, and they rely on their teachers to define that for them. So if a teacher has put in a zero because of human error that they didn't receive something, and a 10- or 11-year-old is looking and seeing their grade just went from a 99 to a 70 or something like that, that's going to cause a lot of anxiety all night long. Whereas an adult, we can say, I'm sure it's a mistake, honey. You'll ask her tomorrow. You'll figure it out. Um, it's it's really hard. I think those ups, it sort of determines your mood based on what you've seen online that night. Yeah, I, I would agree about that. Um, and I feel like part of my job as a parent is to be that it's okay it's not that big a deal. You know, you still have other tests or projects to hand in. I feel like I haven't really had to push my kids to do better in school. I've had to kind of encourage them to back off yeah. <laughs> on some of that. And I yeah. think that's just that's just my kids. And I think some parents are going, of course, have the opposite, um, where they wish their kids cared that much um, about it. But I, I just find it interesting that this instantaneous – of society with social media has really spilled over into the academic world. And then we have the whole social media, (laughs) you know, social part of it, Um, which, you know, which is all about likes and do they like my pretty Instagram picture and um, really take into heart all these things that happen to celebrities who live, you know, my kids are really into K-pop, Korean pop. And so they're like, I mean, they're halfway around the world. I'm like, yeah, you're, that, that doesn't really impact you, and yet it does. So 
Um, you know, how has social media, do you feel, really changed um, our teens and their social life? So I was, I, I really just wrote a new blog post about how the new version in my my mind for teenagers, um, instead of basing their day on how many likes they've received, it's about what group chat you're included in. Mm. <laughs> and that really, you know, if, if you have been kicked out of a group chat or a group chat was created without you versus, um, oh, they added me to their group chat and now my life is fantastic. <laughs> um, this has become a really defining thing as opposed to like they sat with me at lunch. <laughs> right. um, now if I'm added to the group chat, I am in and then it's maintaining that inness. Oh, uh, yeah, kind of the um, opposed to the old, like you said, I'm with them, I can hang out with them in the hallways. Now it's who am I hanging out with on social media. Right, and I think that's almost taking the place of the likes on Instagram mm. and the likes with all those other things because I think for teenagers, you know, maybe you've seen this too, like in your practice or whatever, that um, there's generationally my, you know, upper 20s clients – do the Facebook messaging, um, the, um, you know, older teens, younger 20s are doing a lot of the Instagram, and then the younger teens are still really much more focused on the Snapchat group messages. While they follow Instagram and they scroll through it, the real social stuff happens on Snapchat. So that could just be my Chicago area clientele. But that's sort of generationally where their heads are. And then me as the adult therapist who, um, you know, has my own (laughs) boundaries with different social media outlets, trying to be in their world with them based on whatever they're using and making sure it's in their best interest, not self-sabotaging. Right. Right. And do you find that – it's harder for for kids to to kind of navigate that social media world. I mean, because it's never off. It's never off. Um, I I'll tell you a personal story. I said to my oldest when he was in junior high, when he got a smartphone, which was a really big deal. He was going in eighth grade, and I said, um, you know, you can have these rules with it, whatever it is, and the boundaries we set as a family. But I said in terms of Snapchat, because at that time, that was um, maybe three or four years ago, my clients were all getting rid of it and saying, I felt so much better since I've deleted this app. Um, I said to him, you can get Snapchat on your phone when you can come to us and explain why it will make your life better. Mm. You need to be able to just explain that. And Honestly, he didn't come to us until he was second semester freshman year. At that point, we kind of were just counting our blessings and saying, right. how, how can we say no? Like You yeah. could have done it anyway behind our back at this right. point. Um, and he said, my whole soccer team is making plans for practices on Snapchat. And you know, that's an obvious answer. Like, of course, then we want mm-hmm. you to be included in your team practices. Um, and his coach was doing it as well. They had their own little group. So then he had Snapchat, and, you know, sadly, it's never looked back. Right. <laughs> um, but but that, that's kind of like I had to parent that boundary and teach that boundary rather than have him just go to town with it and, you know, catch up in the morning with an hour of stories and watching and seeing what everyone's posted and then, in the evening, if he's doing his homework, if he's going to watch stories or not, and making sure that that is not the number one priority on his list. And I think that's so hard for kids. So hard. I mean, but, I mean, let's face it, it's hard for us, right? I mean, yeah. we're adults, and we have all this knowledge and um, life experience to know how we should order our priorities at work, at home, we know, and we know when we're wasting time on whatever social media that we we happen to be our favorite. Um, and it's, I think, one of the most the hardest things for 
parents is that recognizing that our kids have an even harder time developing those boundaries themselves, right? I mean, because of their brains are not as developed and all that kind of stuff. And recognizing what makes them feel bad. Mm. You know, if you're looking at it and it's making you feel bad, bad about yourself, if whether somebody, you know, is posting about you or you are seeing what people did when they told you they weren't hanging out or someone was supposed to get back to you and they didn't and then you see they're out and about. I mean, it really, really does a number on anybody for a lot of good reasons. It would do a number on me. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> a lot to see. It's a lot to take in. And they're so young. Even teenagers are so young mm. to take in all that stimulation. Um, is really overwhelming on them, I think. Yeah. And I, um, as you, as you were talking, Lynn, I was remembering that I had seen, this has been several years ago, somebody mm -hmm. I knew posted this, these pictures from a, I think it was a, either a baby or a wedding shower. And it was like looking like everyone, I feel like everyone I knew was there and I had no clue it was even happening. And right. I remember saying to my husband, I said, this is so stupid. Why am I upset about this? You know, why am I upset? And when I knew I sure, you know, I knew it really didn't matter. It really was not a reflection on me, you know, but I still was hurt. And it just was one of those moments where I was like, really reminded how it felt like to be a teenager, right? And everyone yeah. went to the party or everyone's on the group chat but you and you're finding it out later in that I think it's good for us as parents to remember those feelings. So not that everyone, I think everyone should have to actually experience them, but I think if we can just really think back and remember, it can help us have more of that empathy with our kids when they're like, well, instead of dismissing it, well, it's not that big a deal. You're not in that group chat, you know, to really remember right. how that feels. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. That we can validate it rather than you have other friends. It's fine. Right. Right. Cause that's so not helpful. That's what my husband said. I said, that's so not helpful. <laughs> right. I no. know this, I know like, this, but tough. it hurt. You know, it, it hurts. Hurt. So, um, and I think that that when we can look for more ways to validate and have conversations instead of um, mini lectures or just dismisses, that can really help us keep that connection with our kids, so that we can notice if they seem to be slipping into um, a depressed state or. Um, a, you know, something that's um, not mentally healthy for them, right? And right. We keep that connect. Can you talk a little bit about how, what maybe some things that um, we could be on the lookout for? Not that we're going to be like with a checklist going, okay, is my teen sleeping? Or, but just that kind of help us to be aware of what they're going through. Yeah, well, I mean, Sarah, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Is your teen sleeping? Yes. Number one, I. And I say that to my kids. I said, you know, your friends that aren't sleeping, those are the ones that are going to be in a therapist office one yeah. day. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's so true, though. If you can have good sleep hygiene, and for some kids that's a really hard. It's not just that easy to be like, go to sleep, get eight hours or nine or ten. Um, it's really hard for a lot of kids because they're sad, they're anxious, they're stressed mm -hmm. out. But if they're up, if they're – ways you as a parent can put in boundaries to ensure that good sleep hygiene, I think all the way through high school, it is our responsibility to teach that that's a priority, um, not to say, well, they're 15, 16 now, they're going to make their own decisions. I think we have to mm. keep helping them understand that, that that's number one. I, I hierarchy that for all of my clients and follow that in my family too. Sleep followed by nutrition, followed by exercise, followed by medication. That's the hierarchy that I personally like to follow. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure there's people out there who disagree with me with the medication part as well. But get your sleep. Yes. And there's a zillion strategies that I have and I offer when kids are having trouble sleeping, um, even when it's driven by depression and anxiety, to help them settle their head and get 
that quality sleep um, because that is going to make your mood off. How do you feel when you don't have a good night's sleep? I know I'm more susceptible to crabbiness and even tears. Right, <laughs> um, right. If I'm not well rested. So that's number one. And then I also think that um, depression can be so easily masked by numbing mm. behaviors. Yes. So watching Netflix, looking at your phone, um, any of those kind of things that you see your kids doing a lot of. You know, we all watch TV shows. We all, you know, check out and we need our little breaks, and that's fine. I'm talking the ratio that you as a parent knows is probably higher than it should be. Tune into that. Mm. You know, why are they checking out? Why are they trying not to think for so many hours a day? Right. Um, and if it's because of stress and good reasons and they deserve a break, that's okay to validate but let's find some ways to bring them joy rather than just checking out right and I loved um, and I know you probably have some more points but I loved what you said about how they use it to kind of numb their mind and check out and I think that that is kind of an important distinction because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts and you know when our kids can't they seem to really can't be be without their phones and stuff. That's, I mean, that's a kind of a sign that, hey, something's a little off here if they can't put it in the family basket at night. Or, you know, our girls, we make them charge their phones, you know, away mm -hmm. from, way far away from their bedroom, <laughs> bedrooms, Which you know. Which is great. And I, a lot of parents feel helpless about that. And, and I think, like, and even if you want to share your methods for just making sure that happens, um, that's something I have to work with a lot of parents on, that you do have power over that and to make sure it is away from your phone. Well, I, um, I you know, bad. yeah, um, for, for us, Lynn, I mean, my, my kids know that, um, I mean what I say and I say what I mean and they know I'm like, you gotta, when they got their devices, you know, I told them, I said, okay, I said, you're charging them out here. Mm -hmm. You know, you should start charging them at least an hour before you go to bed because you need your mind needs that time to relax. And right. I said, and if we, we're going to leave it up to you, but if I notice you're not, you're not going to have your device. Yeah. You know, and, and you start that early, right? Yes. Like you start that early. I started that when they were like preschoolers. So, I mean, not with their right. devices, but with that, they know that I'm going to follow through and no amount of screaming and pain on their part is going to make me change my mind when I know it's good for them. Um, right. And, uh, you know, I just encourage my listeners, come up with it. Follow it yourselves. You right. Know, we, right. We all should. Absolutely. Yeah. We all so when, you, when we as older moms might wake up during the night to use the bathroom, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, not, not taking a peek at your phone. Right. Right. And we really need to follow that. We really need to show them that it can be done, that it is healthy, and it is for their good um, to get that sleep, to get that rest. So, um, yeah, that's that's my tip. Now, did you have you? I think you had a few more, um, a few more points to go through. Yeah, well, and, and the numbing thing is huge. Mm. You know, there's a million things that follow under that. But I I think like the helpless as a parent feeling is a really scary feeling. It might feel that way when your child is four or five and having tantrums all the time mm -hmm. and you feel helpless up until, you know, forever probably. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly teenage years when you want to give them the independence, you remember your own teenage years when you felt independent. So, you know, helicopter mom is quite a stigma now. So right. how much do we let our kids fly? How much do we parent still? Um, I think if, all parents go back to trusting themselves, mm -hmm. then they're just fine. They're just fine. Listen to your gut. If your kid is different, off, um, follow through and ask. And it's okay to be wrong, and I think kids want to be cared about. Um, no, even if you're wrong, it's okay to say, like, hey, you know, sit with me for a sec. What's going on? Um, how are you? Tell me something good. 
and you know, they they make those jokes since we were kids about driving the car with your kid and right. see if they'll talk or not looking at them. If you have a dog, walk the dog with your kid. It's true. Yes. <laughs> it's true, and they want to talk. I think that if we just ask questions and we're non-judgmental in our questions, um, you know, not – did you win the game, but how did you feel about the game? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you think you did? How do you think the test went? Um, not did you study for the test? Right. Or that's what happens when you don't study. You're right. No, the right. I told you that out of yeah. <laughs> right. Make it safe. Because you guys, we all, have, we all have a list of battles. You know, just pick your big ones. Yeah, and I, um, and I think that is... I know that's been true in my own life that sometimes I have really practically bitten my tongue into, you know, to not say something to my teen because I know that I can tell that they're already kind of beating themselves up or, um, you know, are really upset about something, even though maybe I did tell them <laughs> that it was going to turn out this way. And I'm like, you know, it's not my, that's not my job. I always feel like for for teenagers, my job is moving into more that mentor and a type um, relationship yes. so that they can successfully make these decisions, knowing that I've got their back, right? I'm there, right. and helping them to move, you know, forward into adulthood, um, because that's my goal. My goal is not to have a kid who's dependent on me their whole life my goal is you know to help them to launch into adulthood so they can live their own life because you know hey i got a life i want to live too if the the kids are all crying (laughs) my husband and i got plans (laughs) (laughs) right no but you want to be able to celebrate them and i think so desperately they want to be celebrated because who's celebrating them in their lives you Mm. know everyone is the kids are all trying to survive Right. They're all trying to just not have a bad day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that if we can celebrate our kids, it does go a long way. It does, and I think that is a great way to end our time together, Lynn. That we, you know, when the more we can keep those connections with our kids, help them to get the sleep they need, the good food and exercise that they need, and to really notice them, notice if their mood changes, notice these things, and Ask those open-ended questions. I think that's that's what you were talking about to really not make it seem like mom's in another lecture mood, but that mom cares, or right. dad cares too. Don't forget the dads. I'm not leaving the dads out. <laughs> dad cares too. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. Well, thank you so much for being with me today, Lynn. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. This was fun. Thanks for having me. Uh, You've been listening to You've Got This. I'm your host, Sarah Hammerker, and today I've been talking with Lynn Zachary. She's a therapist in Chicago, and you can find out a little bit more about Lynn in the notes for this podcast, and I hope I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast of You've Got This with Sarah Hammerker. Sign up to receive notification of new podcasts and listen to previous editions at sarahhammaker.com. Until next time, remember, parenting might be hard sometimes, but don't worry, you've got this.